Warning. I think a warning is in order to begin with. I think what follows will probably prove to be very dull for you. You can of course attempt to listen to this story about a man named Montminy, but not a lot happens in this story. You will get to know Montminy and me a little, but not very well. Not to the degree that you expect or are used to, and that will likely not be enough and could in fact make you angry. You probably need and want and deserve more. You are used to more. You are used to more, and you will certainly be used to that moreness being delivered to you at a faster rate. The speed of my pitches may be too slow for your fast bat, and you may find yourself swinging and swinging, with the ball still not yet off my fingertips. Some years ago, I lay upon a chair for many weeks drinking tea wrapped in a blanket and very sick. It was at that time that I read Jane Eyre. I am periodically bedridden, and during those times I find myself reading the slower novels of yesterday, David Copperfield, Maul Flanders. In such stories, every word weighs more and must be carried along like a breath turned to stone and added to Jacob Marley's chains. There are long sequences of nearly nothing happening within which maybe a candle is lit and something is seen out a window, something in the fog that was frightening back then, but is not now. We rarely light candles and are no longer afraid of that thing in the fog, and so this story is like one of those old stories of yesterday, with candles and creatures in the fog, and ponderous and breathy, and anxious more of feelings we no longer have, such as fear of that something in the fog and love of the heavy and slowly delivered scene. You will need to want to keep with you all of your old breaths turned to stone. You will need to light a candle and recall those ancient fears and forgotten feelings. You have been warned. You may say, if you like, that I didn't warn you. I will forever be too slow and elsewhere to ever know or care to know, and so you will always be in the right. Thank you. The fingerprints of the fallen down. Aunt Minnie begins now. Soften, steel, good, find the bends. The backbone of the city till the end. Like bluebells on.
Maybe, if the old man asks me to, or lets me do another one of these. I'll tell you how I arrived in the town of Lemon about ten years ago, and came to live in a horse barn at the end of an old road that wasn't a road and still isn't, but which not their road still appeared, and appears yet, on the town map. And there remains a street sign standing to this day in the woods, jutting out from a red-buried thicket, and the old street sign reads, Road Lane which is not the name of any road or lane I have come upon to this point, except my own now, I suppose. Nor have I seen a road street, or street road, or lane avenue. But horse barn on road lane in Lemon, though I don't have a mailbox and so no mail either, is my address, I suppose. And road lane, the space of it, which is just a wooded area, no different than the woods, yet with this unexpected sign in the berry thicket, was, when I moved in ten years back, not even really a path anymore, though it is now, do my footsteps, a path about which I sometimes look at with some recognition as I travel down it day or night, wondering if this path I alone made by my own feet and style of walking and sense, or lack of sense of direction, might look like me as far as paths. And does it look like me, I wonder, and wish to ask someone who might take the question seriously and actually examine us both? Not a mirror image, but a kind of strange representation, at least a kind of expression or imprint of who I am, because I made it with just my body and body compass and inner feeling of where a path should be as it runs about a quarter mile through the woods at the bottom of Market Mountain. The path is the dark duff worn brown of a barber's leather strap, and about as wide, but very crooked and jagged, and not sweeping and gentle as most paths are, and it winds around a little too wildly, as though its maker and designer probably never knew exactly where he was heading, nor what his feet and kind of self were making as he went along, and in parts the path is very clear. But there is one section in particular where I go jumping over a few rocks of a crumbled wall, where the path dies for ten feet or so, and picks up again after the last fallen rock. So I wonder if amongst the rest of the qualities that make up the path, that that too might be characteristic of me. That I jump up on my own rocks and die for ten feet or so, and pick up again somewhere else. That maybe I am hard to find or follow for short ways, and have liked not to be found, and so I made the path like. This beginning, for example, even here, is what I mean. That we can't help but make what we are. There's a reason, I suppose, my address is only possible, and in that way might be Horse Barn on Road Lane in Lemon. And a reason I don't have a mailbox yet, and I'm two steps back from the brim of the world, and as I said, I get no mail. Maybe, later, too, I'll tell you how I came to work for the old man who lives halfway up the mountain, at the bottom of which I now live, and which person you were probably expecting to hear instead of me. But he's otherwise occupied, and in the midst of something else, and asked me to fill in and tell you a story at this difficult time, and he suggested that I tell you about Mont Mini. I should tell you before we take a step further that I used to be a painter, and so this may sound like a painting more like a painting of Montminy, or a series of paintings about him, than a story about him. For example, I have hardly mentioned Montminy, and yet this story is about him, and it's like he's the center of the painting, but I am spending most of my time signing my name in the lower corner first, before even beginning to paint. At the same time, I'm not sure if this story is more about me, and how I tell stories. Perhaps the whole of the painting will be a kind of signing of my own name, even when I'm trying to paint Montminy directly. So please know, as I speak, that I want it to be about him, and am trying to make it about him. But again, as I say, I'd bring up what's already been said about the resembling path, and how my path at home, I think, looks like me. And I suppose that's why I told you about it in the first place. And maybe that's the point of stories, or just what happens when anyone tries to tell a story about anyone else. It's just a story about them, in some more or less cloudy or clear or important or not, or higher or lower way. Begin. To begin with, although maybe it's to end with, and more of something we could say after the fact of knowing him, so, to end with, was the way he looked, the way he sounded, his voice, and even his name, 
Montminy, and the way those three things, or four if you count his name, rolled together to make such a very clear person that could only be him. Whereas, for example, I feel my own parts in a heap and a jumble, and feel I hardly make sense in the simplest way, and am more like a patched and gauzy contraption of different people struggling along together, a family, maybe, with some cousins and strangers thrown in, some no longer even alive, but a family at war, or at least at sea, or maybe at war at sea. But not in boats, just all these strangers swimming about in battle, treading water, and mostly trying not to drown in the midst of their vast and bloody war in the middle of the ocean. Even my eyes are slightly different colors, and my legs different lengths, and I walk with what I always thought was a kind of intriguing style, but which lately I have discovered is considered nothing but a limp by most. Or to put it another way, as I have begun to ask, there is no one yet who thought I had about me an intriguing style of walk. All have said limp. But everything about Montminy seemed congruent and aligned and in agreement, and as though designed with every other part of himself in mind, and this gave him a special kind of clarity and in keepingness, as though he were double or triple outlined and engraved and brighter of color, saturated from this harmony and over-sharpened. And yet, too, there was also something alive or playful or evenly sad in his same-colored sky-green eyes, which also flowed cleanly outward from his singularity that said, Yes, this world may be a dream, and I may be a dream within it, and for these reasons I am the way I am. You may not recall how we envied him, his certainties, as we might envy the symphony of minor objects that comprise a watch, and the watch itself as well. That so much that is so small could do so little with such precision, and be so accurate about a something that, yes, it well knows, does not exist. Well, even if you can't remember now, that is how we thought of him in the most abstracted way. Montminy was a farmer, and then a hat model, and lastly in his short life he was the editor of the Lemon Times. I'll repeat all that, and add to it here and there during the course of this story, which is a eulogy, I guess, how Montminy started out as a farmer here in Lemon, how he went on to become a hat model in New York City, and finally how he returned home, bought the local newspaper, and installed himself as its editor. I've said all that now twice, farmer, hat model, editor. Thrice, I've said it now. You might begin to consider me an unstoppable force, at least as far as saying those three things. I could say them all again, if I wanted. We men who live in horse barns at the end of almost roads along paths that bear a canny likeness, and tell stories of others who may secretly be ourselves, have a peculiar power all our own. Amen. Amen. In the last year or so that he was back and running the newspaper, which was just last year, you would often see Montminy crossing his own windy field in the early ash morning in a dark and maybe too big suit and a long black tie flapping around with the life of a snake with an old-fashioned flying saucer-style hat on his head. Because of the high winds coming down from the mountains, like invisible come from anywhere rivers, Montminy had to fight to keep that hat on, and his right arm would always be winged overhead, and his right hand clamped tightly down on the hat during the half-mile run across field to his office in town. And it wasn't a full run, but the kind of eager dash of a man in a hard rain, who was maybe holding a newspaper over his head and trying to move swiftly but politely and as dryly as possible through a hard rain that he wondered was maybe brought overhead just for him on this particular day, to soak him to the bone when he could least afford to be wet. Whenever I saw him crossing the field, struggling to keep his hat on, it seemed to me that he ran fastest when the wind blew hardest, and he'd slow when it tuned down, as though the two were friendly in some way as far as motion, and once I saw him standing in the field, not at all moving and not holding his hat, but just resting, I suppose, the wind having completely for that very brief moment, stopped. 
I myself never saw this or knew this to be true, but some claim to have seen Montminy crossing his fields without a hat, and yet still keeping his arm in that flying wing manner above him, as though he thought a hat were still yet set there. Montminy was questioned about this in the form of a submitted letter to the editor, and his response was that if he wore a hat and it was windy, he would hold it down. But if he wore no hat and it was windy, he would not pretend to hold it down. And he went on to more broadly suggest that not only did he always wear hats in his always windy field, but that there were many things in the world that he did not do. He did not snore, for example, or talk to himself in the same way that he did not act as though he must keep a hat on his head in high winds when there no hat was, as was his strange way of putting it, which I remember liking. And lastly, in his written response in his own paper on that day, he set out a reward of a hundred dollars for anyone who could offer proof that he did any of these things. This was meant to be a fun bit of levity and a way of finalizing his point that he did not do this thing with his hat when there no hat was, which meant, however, thereafter, daily, and I mean daily, at the edge of the field, as it dropped along the road in town, that a few of us would stand with cameras, hoping to take a picture of Montminy, mantling across the windy field without a hat, and yet with a hat arm, as the effort came to be called. And so now we have many photographs of Montminy crossing the field, in his hat, in a kind of blurring half-jog, his suit and snake tie all blowing about, and his head tipped down as though he were a ship barging through flanks of ice, and in many, or maybe all, of these shots, he is up aloft in the air. Somehow, so many of the photographers had the urge to snap their photos at the moment Montminy was middle-bounding upward from the earth, and it is the case that I have not actually seen one of these photos in which Montminy did not appear to be floating some inches above the ground. But yet not a single one shows him without a hat and doing the hat arm. And then too we have very poor and low quality audio recordings of Montmany's footsteps as he walked here and there in town, as people hoped to catch him talking to himself and earn a hundred dollars. And in addition we have the purported tape sounds of Montmany sound asleep in his bed at home, I suppose, and breathing audibly with a light degree of crackling in each breath in a manner that could be and has been suggested could be interpreted by a more professional type concerned with such matters as a form of incipient snoring. But as he's gone now, those of us who are reasonable mostly agree that he was as he said he was, and we would say that Montminy did not snore or talk to himself or try to keep any hat on his head when there no hat was. Someone from the outside world would wonder why we kept taking pictures of a man trying to keep his hat on, when the point was to get proof that he wore no hat and yet was trying to keep a not-there one on, and it wouldn't be possible to explain how it was that soon, in lieu of the cash prize, how we came to love taking pictures of Montminy as he seemed to float above the ground. You will all perhaps remember this now, I think, and if you don't, then be assured that that is how it was for us. Was it John, or Ed, or Bob, or Al? I don't remember Montminy's first name, and hope to never know it. Phil, or Frank, or Bill, or Bob, or Fred, or Don, or George, let it always be not known, and never known, to any of us. Today, I told myself earlier, when I go to the cemetery, I'll have to make such a concentrated effort to not see Montminy's first name on the stone. I'll have to make a squint a hundred yards off in the old stone part of the cemetery, or wear two eye patches, or remove my glasses, before I come to stand here amongst you, is how I put it to myself. 
Perhaps some of you can relate to this. I often do the exact things I wish I'd not, unless I make such a concentrated effort, very similar to a vow. If, for example, there are two cupcakes left in the box on the table, and I say to myself, please, don't eat both of those today, sir. Spread them out, friend. Eat one today, and the other tomorrow is the best way, my own dear self. And I will be eating them both, right then and there, even as I'm polishing up this highly acceptable plan to distribute the two cupcakes ever so smartly over the course of two days. Both, then gone, as I sign my name to the formal agreement. Unless that is, of course, I make such a concentrated effort, very similar to a vow, and in that case, sometimes two cupcakes might stand a chance of spanning two days. Because Montminy is more than enough, I think. Joe Montminy, Jack Montminy? No thank you. Just long, silent space. Montminy. Farmer, hat model, editor. Montminy was the son of a local farmer, and then a local farmer himself, of root vegetables, of all the farms to farm, is how my employer said it to me before he introduced me to Montminy, who was hip-deep in field dirt, searching for yet another thing he'd grown. Carrots, maybe, or other buried fishwood, which, as you know, was what Montminy called his vegetables. Fishwood. As like the earth was a kind of ocean, and his potatoes and carrots were the swimming fish. Certainly, he had potatoes in those fields, and carrots, and possibly parsnips, swimming around that hard, dark sea of soil where he too roamed and plowed and happily swam. Montminy followed on from his father, and the farm stand was just called Montminy. That was all it was called. Not even the Montminy farm stand, or certainly potatoes, possibly parsnips. Just their name, hand-painted by a long-gone Montminy on a battered metal sign, hanging by a wire on a wooden caravan on wheels, in front of their potato or parsnip field. For not even Montminy knew what kind of fish were down there swimming beneath those stiff and stubbled and rocky waves. And the caravan, of course, was always semi-loaded down with those coal miner-like vegetables, and Montminy looked like a soot-black coal miner himself in those days, just painted in the Lord's good black earth almost every time I saw him back then. And that caravan, by the way, fell apart and nearly to dust about ten minutes after Montminy, the last living Montminy there shall ever be, died which tells us something, I believe, though I'm not sure what. He was never a good writer for the newspaper he lastly ran, and I don't believe he sang, but he spoke with tremendous melody, and when he spoke, especially later, after he'd become the editor of our paper, there would be those who could be seen tapping their toes, and there were those who would begin to faintly hum along, and it was almost the case that even small meetings about small things at the paper would draw a roar of applause from his employees for his lovely voice, which also meant that anywhere he talked, he turned whoever was near him into a tapping and humming audience. And even simply speaking to him alone in the street, you would feel your hands come together as he was on his way away. And there were some who would, in fact, clap upon parting with him. I recall I didn't really know this about his voice back when he was a root farmer, but on second thought, I realized that I would often find myself at his farm stand making up a bag of braided turnips or hair-tied carrots just to get a chance to hear him speak to me in his field. For you'll recall that the method was that you gathered whatever you wanted into a bag and then went out to find him in the field. And when you did, you told him what you'd got and how much you thought it was, and then you paid him, and it was the least sensible and most pleasing exchange operating on the planet. And if you couldn't find him, it was fair for you to go home without paying, according to him. But you mostly would, and Montmany would say a few small expected things, and so would you yourself, and you would linger a bit to get him to say something more, and prompt him about weather or crops, and what it felt like to be so filthy and buried in earth so much of the time. I realize this is likely not something any of you remember, so let us picture it now. How you'd stand at the caravan alone and make up a bag of this and that and then go out to find him somewhere in the field. And there he'd be, down in the dirt, swimming around collecting potatoes into a sack. And you'd hand him your money 
and he'd roll about, checking his pockets for the change due back, and you could hardly see him down there, or know him as a thing different than the dirt, and he would say something simple and uncomplicated, but even then you half knew you'd come only to hear his voice, and that you weren't even wanting what was in the bag, not as much as that, not really. And as you crossed away from him and headed home, you'd recite what he'd said to you on your way across the field, or if not the words exactly, then the sound of the words, as though it was a new song you'd just learned to hum, and you were hoping hard not to forget it. And I will tell you, I still hum some of these things, Montminy said, and hope not to forget them, though of course I one day will. But I still hear myself humming the things he said, and if you do as well, I would ask you to take a moment here and recall such songs privately to yourself. In the mission statement he printed in his first issue of the Lemon Times, Montminy wrote that he believed he'd experienced all the dimensions the world had to offer. He had lived the hard-earth, arm-deep life of a man of the soil, and then suddenly, and magically, his job had become simply to allow himself to be photographed in hats for the back covers of glossy magazines. This was, he informed us, as far as he was concerned, the full gamut of possible human experience dirt farmer to hat model. And it was this that qualified him, this full width and broadest of gamuts, to be the editor of the Lemon Times. He was very hopeful that we would accept a non-newsman, a man who could not write so well and who had never written anything, who had only ever been a very poor and obscure farmer, and then a wealthy and well-known hat model, as our new and only intermediary and our governor between the things that happened in the world at large as levied against those things we'd be permitted to know of and come to understand in his paper. We granted this permission with the greatest ease. In fact, I believe we were so pleased with the idea of Montminy becoming our editor that a notion arose and the gossip began that we would soon be allowed to vote on this as though it were a public office or nomination we could lend our individual support to, for it was that we wished him to know that we, each of us, were saying yes to it. But of course Montminy had purchased the paper and owned the paper and effortlessly hired himself as the new editor without the need for any vote. But it was so like him to sense this in the air, and so, in his very first week in office, as we thought of it, Montminy did call for a local vote, of sorts, though of course it wasn't really a vote. But I think he knew that we longed to speak out to him in this supporting way. And so, in the glass-windowed kiosk outside his newspaper office, he installed a substantial cork approval board with the name of every family and resident in town. And this cork board, my friends, he said to us, and I can do it no justice, but even just a few words into this speech, some of us had begun to hum along with our breath, and others had shifted and readied themselves to begin to tap. And this cork board, my friends, will remain here, my friends, and you may all Anyone, or all of you, come to our kiosk whenever you like, many times a day, or never, and slide your name or your family name from yes to no to indicate your support or lack of support of my running the paper, so that I may track how well I keep or lose your faith and confidence. How you feel about me will be here forever, always rising and falling like the changing weather until my boat sinks. And if ever I am voted out, if it ever comes to such disapproval of myself, I will allow your voices to be heard. I will be frank with you. I will allow it. I will not stay when I am not wanted. Even if I own this paper, if I lose your confidence and support, 
I will keep this job no longer, and will leave it in your good hands, and you shall know that you are, and were, always above me, and not the other way around, and that I am, and was, only and ever your servant, and you, not, and never, mine. All those around me tapping and humming, and some echoing his words, and you, not, and never, mine. And there being a kind of storm of sound in the air that followed, that startled us, this sound of us still keeping the sound of him alive in the air around us. So much so that to this day there are several of us here in town who can naturally, without any effort, recite the corkboard speech, as it's come to be called, and which we will recite, I'm sure, at certain meetings or times of year. And if ever friends call upon one of us, we are only too happy to recite it and sing the story of Montminy's court ball. If ever I am voted out, if ever comes to such disproof of myself, you will allow your voices to be heard. You will be frank with you. You will allow us. You will not stay when I am not wanted. Even if I own this paper, if I lose your confidence and support, you will keep this job no longer. You will leave it in your good hands. And you shall know you are and were always above me, and not the other way around, and that I am and was only and ever your servant, and you not, and never mine. How Mont Mini transitioned, at the age of 23, from grubbing, teeth sore, and loose soil, which was how he described his root farming in his first Lemon Times letter from the editor, after he bought the paper with his hat model money, and installed himself as editor. How he went from dirt farmer to hat model, he never did say, and this was not known by any of us in town, as far as I know. He was seen walking down Main Street one day, with a small suitcase and an even smaller smile, both packed full to bursting, I'd imagine. Had any of us ever seen him fully standing up on the planet until that point? So clean and so two-legged and so standing up atop the earth that we were not entirely sure it was him. An unknown, smiling stranger passing through town for no known reason was half the thought we had, and there was no other half-thought. Which actually, my own thought about it tells me, is what thoughts are, for the most part. Just half-thoughts in themselves, which is why you wonder about them, and how you search for the other half is the integrity and tension and pleasing friction of a thought. And that's how I think we as people are, too, in some more ununderstandable way. But yet half thoughts, searching for our other halves, and this then being our integrity as well, and our living tension, and the pleasing friction of our being. But a series more of these half thoughts and not entirely sure moments followed. For the next thing we knew, someone at the coffee shop had found an image of Montminy on the back of a fragrant and shiny magazine. This man in this old timey hat can't be our Montminy. Can it? This someone said, and we began to wander along with whoever it was as we passed this perfume and very slidey magazine about. You were probably there at this auspicious occasion of our Mont Mini wonder. Many were, for some reason, crowded into the coffee shop as though we knew we'd better all be there to begin to witness the peculiar effect Mont Mini would soon have on us. For we were soon to become, and even then becoming, very one, very we, because Montminy turned our ragged and lonesome and wild and grubbing and teeth sore and far apart he and she's into a shoulder to shoulder town of companions for a short while. How so before we were never a we, but became so with Montminy, and the reason or source that our herd or mass of chilly hearted drifters and lost persons came together to heat our cold-shelled eyes around an unexpected fire, and how he tore us from our preference to hide deep in the cold black stalls of our wandering, shivering souls, with the doors nailed shut and no windows ever installed. We soon found many of these hatted, possible Montminis on the back covers of other perfumed and glistening, and to me, extraordinarily slippery magazines, which I could hardly keep between my hands. To read one, 
would be to juggle oil, so I thought. Are they made of motor oil and black rain and eau de cologne? Regardless, over these images and these magazines we kept dropping, we kept saying the same thing. This can't be our Mont Mini. We'd go out walking around the Mont Mini vegetable caravan, and then beyond, into and over his root fields, some of us, sometimes, alone or together, a couple of us from time to time, looking for him. Some knocked on the Mont Mini farmhouse door, and then peered through the Mont Mini farmhouse curtain windows, in that land ho way of maybe, I'd guess, pirates, hands cupped to foreheads, as though staring into the blazing sun instead of his towel-dim kitchen. Some lesser or greater minds. It's hard to say who was which when odd people commenced their peculiarity, but some of these, either geniuses or duds, dug holes in the patches of the Montmany fields, possibly to get a bit of fishwood dinner for themselves, while knowing they could easily supply an exception or excuse by means of the fact that they could claim to be looking for Montmany himself in the holes they dug as though a potato farmer were subject to easier or accidental burial than anyone else. Look, sometimes they fall into their potato holes, you could imagine them saying. Really? You can imagine yourself saying, Oh, yes, root farmers are all the time falling down the dirt stairs of their earth holes. Geniuses and duds are what we have in lemon. I myself, I will tell you soon, or now I guess I will tell you now, and one of the quiet and fortunate latter. That's quiet and fortunate, not quite unfortunate, which is how it might sound if you think being a dud is not so fine. And yes, I'd say it's better, or at least very fine, to be dull and common. Easier, anyway, to be one of the least of the Lord's semi-half-thoughtful subjects. An unnamed blur-faced man, impossible to see in a photograph of the many thousands gone before I was even here, did not stand out. Unmemorable would be the word, if remembered at all. One of the very slow and hindered, I'm afraid, who showed up when they turned the open sign around to closed, and so he was always late and never had any of whatever it was that they were having, and he never even found out what it was in there, and as it turns out, that's how he liked it. I have poor fragmentary ideas, and strange inclinations that can't reasonably be explained to anyone though I've tried. And I've learned that it's mostly best to not act on any of these things that bubble up inside. So I follow a different code and philosophy. From past history, is what I mean. Things I've come up with have not turned out so well for me, as far as coming up with possibilities and making them so, conceiving of this or that, and bringing such a thing to light. I spoke both of my cupcake problem earlier, and how trying I knew it would be for me to not look upon Montminy's first name on his gravestone at the cemetery, even though I really don't want to know his first name, because there is some part of me that fights against my own desires and interests, the battling family at war at sea that I mention, as though half the point of me is to always assail and eventually defeat the other half. And this is the thing that makes me feel turned inside out most of the time. Everted is a word I once heard that could be usefully applied here. And this fact of being in a state of warring aversion is as well a thing I suppose that is also another of those parts of me somehow, despite my worry or dislike of it, that feels most human. Blessed is he who has no earthly ability to proceed on earth with any ability. Which leaves one like me as a quiet observer of the flights and crashes of the winged flock of ladies and gentlemen and children, and whatever is at the moment alive and aloft, and all those creatures of the forest that surrounds. I'll see a tree fall one day in downtown Lemon, a couple kissing in a forest the next. All is well, as far as I can tell. So, yes, of course, it was as we disbelievingly supposed. We'd been hit had hit ourselves, over the back of the head with the fact by a hundred perfumed slippery magazines made of motor oil and black rain and eau de cologne. And one day it could no longer be denied or quarantined, and we had to allow the undeniable fact that Montminy had 
become a hat model in New York City. It's him. It's him, we started to say. That's our Mont Mini for sure. It's him. It's 100% him. Now then, we had no way to come to terms with this monumental transition of Mont Minis, a thing we almost needed to believe in, as though it was a ghost or fairy, something to have faith in, rather than ever logically understand the not-possible fact of how such a thing could actually be. For it was too hard for us to see how it might be accomplished. A man we knew, without a rocket, had gotten himself to the moon, is what it felt like. I'm not sure anyone in town has ever been, or even knew that you could, or how, to get to New York City. Our cars, our local cars, and mostly their shoes, is something someone once said to me. And the same person also said that our clothes are in-town clothes, and possibly pajamas, that not a one of us would wear to parts unknown, for knowing they didn't suit or match the world beyond. We weren't sure how to leave town, or for good, and we weren't sure why anyone would. It didn't make sense. We were the sort of people who liked to be quietly alone, exactly where we were, is what I mean, and elsewhere seemed like a place where that didn't happen so easily. Here in Lemon, the speed was just right, and there was the correct amount of universe between you and the next person, place, or thing. And I suppose I should say, because you're probably wondering, how did I come to host such feelings as this myself about the man and about the place, as I must have been quite new in town, and could even still be considered new in town, having been here only ten years or so? And yet I carry with me all these attitudes, as though I've lived in Lemon since the beginning of time. First, I did live here when I was a boy, for some short time, and so it was in a way that I thought of it as my own hometown, more than any other, anyway, which catches the sense of the intention that I mean, that I felt I belonged here, and that whatever the climate was or the general state of being, these were my own as well. And though I've only been here now a little while, I am also a natural and inadvertent pretender and absorber and reflector of all those things that I find near me, even standing behind you in a line somewhere, I am feeling what you are, I'm afraid to say, for I lack my own ability to stand in line with my own feeling. Your world is my world has always been my only way, and so it was very easy for me to know what everyone knew and felt. In fact, these are the only things I ever really know and feel, which is the reason I suppose I think I can remember all this about Mont Mini and why it is me and not someone else talking about him, because after feeling such things, I would return to my horse barn on Road Lane and dwell on those feelings that I'd felt, as I still do today, and cultivate such things with loving hands as though the moods and interiors of the people around me in town who I've come to know are like the flowers and grasses of a private wild garden that I am lucky enough to caretake in the way I do, which is to say, as a waterer and watcher over, which is to say, alongside you all. For I am an alongsider, which is just the closest I have ever been able to come, no matter how hard I try to get closer. This distance here, that I can almost point out as a space between us, or between myself and the world, this empty space in the path that is more me than the path of me, is as close as I am able to come. And yet it is also how I am able to remember how we felt about Mont Mini, and the reason for my existence, it sometimes seems to me, so that I might call these things into recollection back to you, and remind you of how you felt once long ago, and perhaps more recently, of all that is here, of our shared, disremembered dream. So how had he done it? That's what we wondered. How had Mont Mini become a preeminent hat model of such standing, the world over, so far away from us and without the vaguest hint that such was looming. Had a famous hat maker come to Lemon to buy potatoes and spotted an unhatted and filthy-faced Mont Mini down the dirt stairs of one of his earth holes, and seen just how right a hat might look when sat upon his mighty head. For we had to admit that Mont Mini looked extremely well, astonishingly beautiful, in the old-fashioned hats and the pictures we began to see on the back covers of those magazines. 
Without a hat, he looked like a perfect statue of cut and shattered stone, a jagged being with black veils hanging down his cheeks and more like the engraved image of a man than a man. It was such a relief to see him in a hat, like a well-made bed or a thing you never knew wasn't finished until it finally was, with the last bit of shaping care. A painting, finally given a frame, or a house, at last topped with a roof, was how it seemed to us. And it was as though a pressure, like an extra gravity, had been released, and we could all relax now that Montmany had been put into hats. And it was here, too, that we seemed to realize altogether that, my goodness, was it possible that Montmany was one of the great human beings of all times? For that was the thought upon which we then unconsciously began to dwell, and soon approved. For from the hats and our long uncertain study of him on the back of these magazines we kept dropping, as against our long uncertain ignoring of him when he was right here with us, swimming in dirt within his fields and near his caravan. But that, yes, he was one of these very rarest of creatures to walk the earth. And for what reason did we think this, and how, and why? None of us could say, nor did we even realize this was the matter most absorbing us. But anyway, from dirt to photographs, from potatoes to hats, from lemon to New York City, it was hard to allow, follow, or, on the other hand, fail to cheer our Montminy as we began to privately and thoughtlessly perceive him as one of the great creatures of our shared human form to come upon and move across, and even within, the earth. We admired him, is what it soon came down to, and even this, without ever knowing, that was the feeling we had. We just looked at the magazine photos in increasing awe and warmth and supposition. My, my, is what we said when a new photograph of Montminy came out on the back of a new magazine. It was a kind of pure and beyond understanding admiration that allowed us to fall so secretly in love with him in the first place and then to fall so even more secretly in love with ourselves for doing so in the second. And of course, none of this was even known to us as a body, not even in the slightest could such words be said. I suppose if I, or anyone like me, who by nature is forced to dwell in such gardens of the moon, might have mentioned it at the time, these growing strong feelings of warmth and admiration and togetherness that we've begun to feel. It might have grown into something more established and tangible and memorable, a state that we might have maintained, or at least been able to later recognize as having happened, such that we could speak of it all today in recollection and unity, instead of it being a thing more or less in the wind, or an invisible air, or something like the opposite of a bad cold we all once caught and soon forgot. For now, even as I bring it up, I can see that no one quite knows what I'm talking about, or could even remember those moments or feelings that we had for him and for ourselves. But then again, let me ask you why you might be here. I might ask you to consider how a man none of you knew well, not at all well, could bring you all out on a day like this to say farewell to an unknown man, and be here still, standing and listening to a thing like this, if you did not in some way, know that what I'm saying is true and nearly within your grasp, a feeling of a feeling for a feeling that was perfectly strong and real, but as underground and buried now, and as likely or unlikely as Montminy's possible parsnips, there but hidden. Fishwood was what this love of us was of ourselves as it flowed back from our love of him, from and to us as a lighted river raised upon the air and charging us anew as an extended body or loose and villagey group unto one another, quite unexpected in this queerly wild town of strange strangers, who, until Montminy arose from the dirt, had kept ourselves so hidden behind our own back doors and collars up, preferring darkness and silence and sleep and walking away from one another. Until Montminy, that is, when we so unknowingly turned back around and headed into each other's arms. Which maybe is what love is, the arising and arrival of a kind of unexpected, overwhelming, impossible to even see, ghost within our midst. Which as it turns out, 
is our own dead spirits from the future, come to appear before they should, and then departing before we know they've even come, or that it was even us, that it was our own dead selves, and so, so, so much of our lives unknown and unseen, and yet lived through and experienced, as though we are dead already, and our ghosts may early come to visit us and whisper these small prayers and dreams into our days, but that we are not allowed to know, or not many of us, and those who do, do not themselves share of it for their melancholy wisdom, and neither is the knowing here for long, as I must tell you, I've begun to doubt it all myself, and soon will not remember, as you cannot, and as well, I'm not sure why we aren't allowed to remember, although I know why I do just now, because as slow as I am, and as far from greatness as I am bound to live, and as alongside you all, and as someone never to be in the center of the action, or the heart of any subject under discussion, or the one to save it all, or have the right idea, or to be found in my field and deemed worthy of hats and ushered off to big cities, and pressed lovingly and nearly infinitely onto the soft, oiled backs of rain-slick magazines, I do have the honor of presiding over the recollection of our grace and of the cold and warm shadows of all that we felt and harbored and so secretly beloved. And his name was Charles. Charles, his name was, and we should all know it. Charles Montminy. And for a little while now, let us close our eyes and remember how we loved him and how much he never knew and how much we ourselves did not, and how it is here that even though we have all forgotten and will only forget even more, that we can together pretend to love him now with all our hearts and our hearts blown wide. Fallen Down. For more information, please visit radioghost.com. <laughs>